people just go back to set in the afternoon drunk. Hello in style, this is Lucas Bravo and you're watching this guy. This guy. My birthday is uh, March 26, 19, 1988. Yes, I remember my birthday. I was born in Nice in the south of France. I live in Paris. I, I don't drink coffee. I just had one before this interview, which is very, uh, yes, which, which defies the purpose of the answer, but uh, I usually don't drink coffee. I love tea. How would you take your tea? Spilled. This question is, is not right. Choosing one dish is assassinating an affinity of other possibilities, and I love everything as long as it's good, and there's so much diversity, so much choice. I cannot, I cannot choose one. It's called The Ice People by René Barjavel. I don't like the title in English. It's a French book. It's called The Night of Times, and it's uh, the most beautiful love story I've ever written, uh, I've ever read. <laughs> I wish I wrote it. I, uh, no, I don't have a favorite gluten. Yes, I do believe that the alignment of stars and the date of your birth can influence your perception on people's personality, which is uh, very naive and at the same time so deep. But I choose to be on the side of believers. And actually, you know, sometimes I can really recognize people's signs just by their personalities. I can tell you when there's a cancer in the room. There's one here, actually. Uh, they keep saying that Aries are just uh, very blunt, confrontational. I'm not into confrontation. I kind of run away from it, uh, cowardly. And I know my, that my ascendant is uh, Capricorn. I heard also that after your 30s, you tend to lean towards your ascendant. I guess I'm an Aries in a sense that I like to jump in a pool and then learn how to swim. I like for things to be organic and, and not do any preparation. And Capricorn, is, is, is it has something to do with maybe uh, an aversion for authority, but in a, in a nice sense, like being the initiator of, of my uh, action. I was 22 and I had no money. I was eating a, one Taco Bell a day, one burrito a day, uh, uh, because that's all I could have offer. <laughs> it just felt like I needed to, you know, uh, build something. It, it felt nice because of the surf and the, the sun and my friends and the palm trees, and, but it, it felt also like it wasn't reality. So I needed to come back to France, get back to the cold and the people complaining and uh, build a career. And I promised myself I would come back at some point with something to defend. And it actually feels weird. I was, I was driving on Sunset two days ago and to see this big Ticket to Paradise billboard felt like a little, uh, you know, full circle for my 20-year-old self. French, English, Italian and Spanish. And I have like nuances of a bit of everything, but you know, master of none. That's such a tough question because I have a thing for the Phantom of the Opera. We have like a running joke uh, with different friends because every time I go to New York, I need to go see the Phantom of the Opera to pass the point of no return, the final threshold. Moulin Rouge is just, I think the movie, the movie made me feel all kinds of emotions, but I'll go for the cringe answer. I'll go for uh, the Phantom of the Opera. I'm, 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 I see all the, all the different locations just like. I once fell asleep in uh, Space Mountain. Yes, true story. We organized that trip like a month in advance and I had to go, we went super early. I had a few drinks the day before. I was just sleepwalking all day and by the time we got to Space Mountain, the feeling of just sitting in a chair, so to speak, it was, I just, I just fell asleep. Not even the, you know, the, the gun in the beginning woke me up. <laughs> There's a picture, There's, you know they take the picture in the beginning. There's a picture of everybody like this and then just fully asleep. My big brother was a lawyer and I feel like when they ask you at 18 what do you want to do in life, it's a, it's a trick question. I don't think you have a clear idea of what you want to do, who you want to be or have enough experience about the outside world to actually make the right decision. I knew for, from the start that I, I, I wouldn't be able to make that choice. I felt very artistic, I would paint, uh, dance, play instruments, but the scholar system pushed me to do something uh, serious, so to speak. I was naive enough to think that, you know, being a lawyer is just always just being in court and like talking to judges and just 
it's as close as it, as, as it got to acting in my mind. And uh, little did I realize this was a spectacular mistake. And this is when I moved to LA. I feel like they all resonate with me because I need to be honest and authentic and also love the character I'm portraying. So I always put a bit of me in the character, like a childhood tiny trauma or like something that happened to me just for the physicality or, or the, the mindset or I always have a backup story to enter a scene. And uh, so every character I've ever portrayed has a, a bit of me and it's, it's therapeutic. Everything I give to a character I, I don't uh, carry anymore. There's like a signed, approved chart in France that says that French workers, cast and crew, must have uh, a bowl of red wine uh, at lunch break in the gathering, which is, uh, I think we're the only country that has that. And uh, yeah, people just go back to set in the afternoon drunk, but it's part of the culture. You would think that it would just uh, interfere with the work, but it actually helps creating a better dynamic on set because people are just more joyful, don't stress this much about the hours and just connect more when they're a bit, you know, whiny. Yes, I did this movie Mrs. Harris that just came out that is supposed to be set in Paris but we shot in Budapest, uh, which is really interesting because Budapest has such a diversity of architectures. It's neoclassic, then you turn at the corner, it's Osmanian. Uh, and then you turn the corner, it's Gothic Revival, and it's so rich and dense, and it's just a mix of everything that doesn't really make sense, but makes it so beautiful. Went to set one day outside in the street, and it, it looked like a perfect Parisian street, and it was, it was Budapest. I think when we talk about education, I think a mother's love defines what your life is gonna be. The love of a mother can make you, you know, reach the stars, and also the lack of it can destroy you. And I, I realized that pretty, pretty early on. And she didn't communicate love through hugging and, and verbalizing it. She was really shy with, with her feelings, but it was even more poetic. She would really do it with her art, with her painting, with her cooking. She's an amazing chef. And every time I, I, could, I, I was able to grab a bit of you know, this love in the different things, it was never direct, and I loved that. It kind of changed my love language in the sense that I now to communicate my love through the prism of different little subtle attention. I, I don't like it to be direct. I, I like for people to catch the nuances. I guess, I, I guess the first one, first day on set, I had met uh, Julia and George before, we had like a cast dinner, but to actually be on set with them and realize that this is actually happening, this is real, was, I wouldn't say nerve wracking, but I was in a state of focus I've, I've never, I had never experienced before on any set. I, I really wanted to be at my best. It was really stimulating, exhilarating. It's very particular, you know, when you work for 10 years and you get this level of attention overnight, this level of visibility, it's, it was really hard for me to uh, feel legitimate to this attention. And uh, it was so positive that some kind of imposter syndrome kicked in and I felt like I wasn't worth the attention. And so it was hard for me to figure out what my, what my place is in the middle of this projection of my own image on myself. And, uh, and then I just adjusted to it. Like everything, we're, we're beings of uh, uh, adaptation. So, I just connect it to fun, because at the end of the day, we're not changing the world, and it's supposed to be fun. And now I'm, I'm really enjoying what it brought me. It brought me here to talk to you. When I was shooting this Mrs. Harris, everything felt right. I woke up, they drove me to set, I put on this uh, 50s costume, and then they escorted me to this huge street with those main buildings and extras everywhere with 50s outfits and I just looked around and it just felt for the first time like I was finally reaching a dream. I was on a proper movie set and it felt also like a time machine because everything was dated. They said action and I, I felt such a such an emotion. I felt like that's it. My my years and decades of works are finally paying off and uh, it's the most beautiful memory I've ever had on set. I see myself actively, actively trying to raise consciousness for our planet. 
and trying to impact the people I love to do so as well, to do the tiny fights because we all want to change the world on a bigger scale, but it, it all starts from within ourselves. I see myself fighting for nature, I guess. My first memorable kiss was, I think I was six. There was this beautiful angel in my class. We spent a year just holding hands, not knowing what to do with it. At some point at the end of the year, we just had a little tiny boop. And uh, wow, electrifying. I flew to another country to get a, a particular gift the person I loved back then really, really wanted. And I was there for an hour, got the, the gift and, and flew back home because they, they didn't have the right one in my country, so I, I went all the way. I'm an Emsworth kind of guy. Emsworth? It's a really hard name to pronounce when you're French. Yeah, love my Thor. Thanks for having me in style. Uh, I hope you enjoyed getting to know me a little better. Uh, be sure to catch my movie Ticket to Paradise in theaters October 21st.